If you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 121, Psalm 121, Uh, This is a great psalm, and it's the beginning of the Psalms of Ascents in the uh, Old Testament. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and and forevermore. Why don't you join with me as we pray and ask for the Lord's help. As we come before you this evening, Lord Jesus, we are very conscious that this is a very different scenario to what we normally are used to. And even though church is made up of people, not a building, we recognize that your people collectively are unable to meet together, yet we can still have your word come to us And we pray that as we spend time just hearing and listening to what you are saying to us, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would inform our minds, that you would open our ears. May this experience not just be turning on of a screen, but may we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit to us through you as you speak. Enable me, the preacher, to be able to preach faithfully to your word. And may you show yourself to be great this evening, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Way back in 1988, I made my way back from uh, Durban to Johannesburg. In fact, I'd moved from Durban, which was a coastal city in South Africa, to Johannesburg because there was to my shame, a particular girl that I was interested in who lived in uh, near Johannesburg. And so I moved up there really for her sake, although long term I was wanting to go to the uh, theological college which was at that point located in Johannesburg. So sooner or later I would have had to have moved up there inevitably and I suspect this was God's way of getting me there willingly rather than unwillingly. If you had lived, if you know anything about South Africa, those of us who lived in Durban hated anything about Johannesburg, so moving up there was not an easy thing for me to do. Well, I was visiting this girl who lived uh, about 80 or 90 k's away, and as I was going to her place on my motorbike, I was pulled over by some cops who were on the side of the road that I was on. And when they pulled me over, they fined me for not cancelling my left indicator on my motorbike. I'd forgotten to cancel it, as you have to do on motorbikes, well, certainly when I had a motorbike. And the fine was uh, not a lot. It was 20 rand, which wasn't even a lot of money back then. And it was one of those things that I meant to get round to paying, but I just forgot about uh, in paying. And one evening, while I was at home in Johannesburg, I had a knock on the door, went and opened the door, and there were two policemen standing outside. And one of them looked at me and said, are you Ian Dean? I said, yes, I am. And he said to me, we have a warrant for your arrest. Now, the moment he said that, I thought, goodness me, I haven't said anything bad about the government recently, and I haven't done anything that I know that has constituted a crime. And I said to them, in connection with what? And he said, you have an unpaid fine. And suddenly it hit me that I'd forgotten to pay this fine. And he said, you are now in contempt of court. And strictly speaking, we should take you with us and put you in jail overnight. So I said to him, when's the court appearance? And they said, it's tomorrow. I said, I can assure you, I promise I will be there tomorrow. And they said, on your word, we will leave you and make sure you're at court. Well, I did turn up at court the next morning. 
And when I stood in front of the judge and he said to me, why haven't you paid the fine? I just said to him, I'm sorry, I completely forgot about it. And he then fined me another 60 rand in contempt of court. And so I hadn't come prepared to pay 80 rand. I'd come to prepare to pay 20 rand. And I didn't have any cash on me. And so what they did, because I couldn't pay it, is they took me directly below the courthouse where they had jail. And they put me in a jail. And I'm sitting there in this jail thinking to myself, what do I do now? And I spoke to the guy as he took me down. And I said, can I phone someone? And he said, yep, you've got one phone call like you see on TV with the Americans. So I got into the phone and I phoned a friend of mine who worked in the city, who is still a friend and still lives in South Africa. And I said to him, Neil, I need some help. I'm in prison. Uh, please come and get me out of prison. And uh, he said, what have you done? So I explained to him the situation, and he packed up laughing. And uh, I think his first comment is, well, see you later, mate. But he did come. He brought the money, and he bailed me out by paying my fine. I did obviously pay him back. But in that moment of crisis, I had nowhere else to turn but to this friend. I was new in Johannesburg. I didn't know a lot of people, and I had formed this friendship with him, and thankfully, uh, he was good enough to come and bail me out. In times of desperation, it's interesting as to where we turn for help. And like me, you probably look to good friends or people to help you out in difficult times and to bail you out when you're in trouble, those trusted friends. But in times where the crisis is even greater than being able to get people to help you out, if you lose your job, for example, what do you do then? Where do you turn for help? You may know someone who can offer you employment, but if you don't, you're in a lot of strife. Or if you get sick and are diagnosed with cancer, if you are, um, if you are in a situation where perhaps uh, you are diagnosed with depression or whatever the case might be, when you're in a, a deep sense of difficulty, sometimes there is nowhere else to turn but to God. And sometimes, not always, we don't always turn to God as our first port of call as we should. And what this psalm does to us, it reminds us, and it's a wonderful reminder, it reminds us then when we are in deep trouble, we can turn to God. And there is help from above. God doesn't simply unwind or wind up the clock in terms of the world and let it unwind and then passively step back and wait to see what happens. But God is actively engaged in his children's life and actively engaged in this world. So that when a crisis like this hits him, it's not as if God is hitting the panic button in heaven and saying, what do I do now? There's a coronavirus. Some of my children are suffering and some of my children are going through difficult times. How am I going to handle this? No, this is something that God had already planned in eternity. And God is already at work in these circumstances to achieve his good and particularly towards his children. And what the psalm reminds us, because the psalm, as it, it comes to us, is about a man who is a little bit insecure, and he has nowhere else to look for help but to God. It reminds us that when we are in similar situations, when we have nowhere else to turn, and we are desperate, we can turn to God, and he promises to give us help from above. Look at this psalm. I'm going to read or go through it as we do. The first thing I want you to notice that comes out so clearly is the sufficiency of God's strength. Look at verses 1 and 2. The sufficiency of God's strength. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Now, let me just pause there because it's important that we understand the context in which that comes out. There are a possible number of, of ways of understanding this, although I think there is one way that fits the context better than the others. Rather than go through all the options, I think what's going on here is if you know anything about Jerusalem, you know that Jerusalem is on a hill. 
and Israel in their life would have certain religious festivals, and everyone in Israel would come up to Jerusalem, they would celebrate those religious festivals, and then afterwards they would make their way back down and go to wherever they lived in the country. And as the psalmist is on his way down from uh, uh, Jerusalem, he is aware of the hills around him. And there are two things that come out of his concern about those hills. He looks up to the hills, and one of the issues is that robbers and wild animals would be in those hills. So particularly on the east side of Jerusalem, as you move down, it was quite dangerous, and sometimes the thieves would wait in those hills, hide in crevices, and as travelers, pilgrims came down, they would come out and they would attack them, rob them, beat them up, and some would even be left for dead. And so the psalmist looks at those hills and he sees some trouble. He also is worried about the wild animals because in the same way there might be wild animals lurking in those hills that you can't see that suddenly come out of nowhere and attack them. And so he is concerned. He looks at the hills and he sees trouble. But there's another issue that's going on here that I think is even more subtle but uh, just as important. One of the things when you read through your Bible, and can I encourage you to do that, it's very important to read through the Bible, is that we are told in the Old Testament repeatedly that the high places on the hills is where idolatry occurs. And you will hear God saying again and again and again through the book of uh, Kings and Chronicles that the kings did not remove the high places. And what would happen is the pagans, and Israel began participating in pagan religion, would set up their shrines on top of those hills. So even looking up to those hills signaled a danger. Not only was there physical danger, but there was religious danger. Because on those hills were where the places that uh, idolatry was practiced. And often Israel got caught up into that idolatry and began to participate in that idolatry. So the psalmist is concerned as he moves down uh, those hills of these things that are on his mind. And so he looks up to the hills and he says, there's danger there. There are problems there. I'm concerned. I'm worried. I'm a little bit anxious about what lurks in those hills. But he says, and this is important to note, but he says, where does my help come from? And he wants to make clear that question is there in order to drive us back towards God. Because he understands and recognizes that there is no help in the hills. There is nothing comforting about those hills. They are only spell danger. And so he says, my help comes from Yahweh. In other words, he looks outside of himself and rather than focus on his circumstances, which you and I are so prone to do, are we not? We look at what's happening around us and sometimes those circumstances cause us to become worried about what's going on. And in this present climate in which we are living, with the government having imposed certain restrictions upon us, there are things that may cause us to end up fearing what's happening. We may be nervous about going out or going to certain places. Are we going to catch this coronavirus? Is it going to be passed on from someone to us? What about when I go out and shop? Is there going to be enough food on the shelves? My wife went out shopping yesterday looking for some supplies and she came back and I said, what was it like? And she said, Ian, there's nothing. There was no meat. There was nothing. I hardly came back with anything. And then when she went out this morning to buy some shop, she said she was at the counter and as she was checking out, she had four bags of frozen vegetables and the cashier said, you have to give two back. You're only allowed to take out two. Now, Janice being as gentle and nice as she did, she didn't kick up a fuss. If it did me, I probably would have got into an argument, but she just gave those bags back, and that's the right thing to do. But those things may cause some people to become anxious about whether or not they're going to be okay in the long term. And what this psalm does is it says, stop looking at the circumstances. 
Stop looking at what's going on around you. Stop allowing your confidence to be in either your government or your ability to generate your own come, uh, income or even in your own strength. At the end of the day, help comes from Yahweh. And he uses that covenantal term of God. You've heard me mention this many times over before. When the name Yahweh is used in Scripture, it is God's personal name. And it is, speaks about that covenantal intimate relationship that he has entered into with Israel. And it speaks about his love and his care for them. Now, what else does he say? I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from Yahweh. And then he makes an important statement. The maker of heaven and earth. Now, you might look at that and say, well, why is that important? I'll tell you why that's important. Because the psalmist is focusing on the creative, sovereign power of God. In other words, the help that God is able to bring arises out of his creative power. And when we spend time to reflect on God's creative power, we are reminded that God spoke and reality came into existence. And then, after creating the world and the animals and the plants, the sky, the sea, the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything we see, God then took some dust and breathed on it, and you and I were created. In other words, the psalmist is driving us back to the awesome, majestic power of God. And if God is the creator of all things, and all power belongs to him, then he is able to marshal all of that power for my good and able to intervene into my circumstances and give me the necessary strength that I need. Now, Ephesians 3, verse 16, I want to read that to you, reminds us of this. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power. Now, that little word in the original language, kratos, for those of you who are interested, speaks about God's creative power. So that when God strengthens you, it's not just the ordinary strength that you might have from day to day in order to fulfill your responsibilities, but rather God imparts to you that same creative power in the inner being to fortify you, to strengthen you, to uphold you, to enable you to face circumstances that you could not endure were it not for God's supernatural strength. Philippians 4 verse 13 reminds us, if I can read it, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And so what the psalmist is trying to get us to do is to redirect our gaze from ourselves onto God. Rather than look to my own ability and resources, I look to God. He enables me in these difficult circumstances. The writer to Hebrews in chapter 4, verse 13 to 16, and particularly verse 16 says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now, it's very interesting, that phrase, because what he's speaking about is God gives us the right kind of grace, whatever our particular need is. He doesn't give us grace that we don't need. So if your need is to be healed, then God gives healing grace. If your need is to have your uh, supply of food, then God provides strength for that. But God gives what we need, when we need it, and how much we need in order to sustain us. And it's important that we remember us. We must not make the mistake 
that Peter made, and you know the story well, in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 30, where Peter, uh, verse 31, sorry, where Peter is in the boat, Jesus walks out on the water, and as he's walking out and the disciples see him coming, they recognize him, and Peter shouts, Lord, can I come out? And Jesus says, yes, come. And Peter jumps out the boat, and we can admire his courage because out of all the disciples, when Peter would finally expire one day, he would be the only one who could say, I walked on water, even if it was for a short while. He walks. What happens? The moment he takes his eyes off Jesus... And he starts looking at what he's done. You can imagine the thought process, though I don't know what his thought process were, but you can extrapolate out. He probably looked and thought, what am I doing? What have I done? Why did I get out the boat? The others are all safe in the boat. Here I am, and the waves are buffeting around, and the wind is strong, and I'm in this place. And the moment he did that, his faith began to weaken. And as a result, he began to sink. And in that moment of sinking, He turns his eyes towards Jesus and he says, Lord, verse 30, Lord, help me. And Jesus, at that moment, turns to him, takes his hand and pulls him up. He didn't give him a lesson at that point about his lack of faith. He gave him a lesson afterwards. But at that moment, that crisis, that point of crisis where he had nowhere else to look, Jesus steps in and helps him in his time of need. And so it's important that in this time of uncertainty, that you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, that you draw on his strength, that you don't just rely on what you are able to do, but that you allow your faith to be fortified in trusting in the promises of of God. Don't allow the panic that is ensuing around you. Don't allow those who are misbehaving in ways that are disgraceful, as the Prime Minister said to them, stop it. Don't allow that to cause you to begin to worry about your own circumstances, but keep looking and keep trusting Jesus. Cry out to him and say, Lord, I don't have the strength in my own. I'm worried. I'm concerned. Help me. I remember when I was in my final year at college, one of our lecturers who I was quite close to, an older man, had to go into hospital and have a third bypass. And the odds were not good that he would survive. He was well into his 60s at that stage. And I remember going into the hospital prior to him going into the operating theater and sitting down with him and uh, praying with him and reading scripture to him. And before I left, I said to him, Jack, how are you feeling about all of this? Uh, He said to me, look, the doctors have given me no assurances because of my age and because I've had this operation before, uh, I'm at much greater risk of not coming out. And I said, how does that make you feel, Jack? And he said to me, Ian, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I'm happy in Jesus. I don't mind what happens if I don't make it, if I don't wake up from this, I'll be in his presence. It's that kind of confidence, that kind of assurance, that kind of settledness that we need in times like this. And it's that kind of inner strength that God gives to his people when they're facing dire circumstances. So can I encourage you while everyone is looking to themselves, while everyone is uh, outside there, those who are not Christians are seeking to, to uh, make sure that they're okay, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is able to help you in these times of need. And then secondly, I want you to notice the sufficiency of God's care, verses 3 to 8. The sufficiency of God's care. Listen to what the psalmist says. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over you will neither slumber or sleep. Now, what point is being made there? Well, simply this. The psalmist is being assured by God that he is not like the idols. 
What's the problem with the idols that he's addressing here? Well, the problem with the idols is that the idols slept sometimes. You remember on Mount Carmel when Elijah is in a face-off against the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings 18. One of the things he does as he mocks them is he says to the prophets of Baal, shout louder. Maybe Baal is sleeping. Maybe he's having an afternoon nap. And moreover, some of the gods would uh, uh, sleep through uh, uh, so, some seasons. And so the people would have to go through rituals in order to wake their gods up so that they would be heard. And the psalmist is saying, our God never sleeps. Our God doesn't need to sleep. He doesn't need to put his head down on a pillow. He doesn't need rest. He is always vigilant. In other words, to the psalmist, whatever his circumstances, wherever he is, whatever he's doing, whether he's sleeping, whether he's walking, whether he's eating, whatever it is, he is continuing uh, to know that God is watching over him. God cares for him. God uh, looks after him. And it's important for him to know that. And so he says, the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. What's going on there? Well, the sun during the day would sometimes cause people, unlike uh, today that we have stuff we can put on our skin uh, that prevents us from getting sunburned, many of them would still suffer sunstroke. And so the sun being quite fierce, they would be able to say, even that is not going to be a problem for you. The moon had certain connotations to it at night. And uh, it is a reminder that they need not fear some of the superstitions that centered around uh, the moon that uh, had permeated the society in Israel. And coupled to all of that, there's another aspect that's coming out here, that God is on God day and night. He is constantly watching you, constantly got his eyes on you. Not for a moment does God ever stop looking and watching over you. And it's very important that we remember that because Isaiah reminds us that even in our old age, he looks after us. Let me read the verses to you, uh, if I can find them here. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 3 to 4. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all of you who remain, O house of Israel, you whom I've upheld since you were conceived and have carried you since your birth, even to your old age and gray hairs. I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you, and I will carry you. I will sustain you. I will rescue you. Here, God's care being expressed towards his people in such broad terms. He knew you when he conceived you. He knew you before you were born. He says, till the day you die, he will watch over you. He will care for you. He will sustain you. He will provide for you. And even in your old age, where frailty settles in and where your body doesn't function the way it functions now. Some of you are still young and you haven't come to that point where your body begins to break down. Trust me, it's going to happen if you live long enough. Even then, God says, I am caring for you. And so in these difficult times, we can know and be assured of God's care for us. Now look what he says, and we're almost done. He says, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life, verse 7. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Now, this is not a blanket kind of all-encompassing, you will never suffer in this life. But rather, the emphasis and comes out of that word harm literally means God will keep you from all evil. God will ensure that evil doesn't affect you, doesn't harm you in a negative way. So even though you're living in a broken world, you're living in an evil world, God says, I'm watching over you, I'm caring for you. 
In other words, God protects you in the midst of a fallen society. God protects you in the midst of brokenness. God ensures that there is a shield around you. And so you can look with confidence to God. And you can know that God's care for you doesn't change. And let me say one other thing that to remind you of. That God's care is not bound up with whether or not you are functioning the way you ought to function. One of the dangers that you and I face is we think that somehow, when our faith is going well, all is okay with God. And when our faith is not going well, God kind of shifts the way he looks after us. God cares for you all of the time. His love for you remains the same all of the time because he does it for the sake of Jesus Christ, whose finished work on the cross guarantees God's 100% care for 100% of the time. And so there is great assurance to know that God has his eye on you, that God knows what you're experiencing now. God knows some of the challenges you are going to face. God has got your back covered. God has got your future covered. God is already in the future. He knows what's going to happen. He knows how all of this is going to end. He knows what next government restrictions may or may not come in. He knows when they will be lifted. He knows when things will ease up. He knows who's going to get affected and who's not going to get affected. He's in control of all of that. And through that, he says to you, I love you, I care for you, you belong to me, my son died for you, he purchased your salvation through his death on the cross. Trust me, look to me, and I will help you. I want to close with just one quick story and then I'm done. Um, A little boy was eagerly looking forward to a birthday party of a friend who lived a few blocks away from him. When the birthday party arrived, there was this great big blizzard that was uh, going on. And the father was a little bit nervous about letting his son go out. And sensing the danger, he, he said to his son, maybe you shouldn't go to the birthday party. And his son began to cry and said, no, Dad, I, I, please, all the other children will be there. I can't not be there. And so the father thought for a moment and then softly, you're right, you can go. And over... Joyed and surprised, the young lad put on his coat because it was a short walk up the street, put on all the necessary stuff for the snow and began walking in that blizzard to his friend's place for his birthday party. As he rang the doorbell, he turned briefly to look out into the storm and his eye caught a shadow of a retreating figure. It was his father. He had followed his son's every step to make sure He arrives safely. Let me tell you, your father is watching over you in this blizzard. Your father is caring for you in this blizzard. He knows what you're going through. And he says to you, there is help from above. There is strength that will sustain you. There is nothing that can happen to you in this situation, in these present circumstances, that God is not able to sort out by giving you the right amount of grace to endure. The issue is not whether or not you and I can make it through. It's whether or not we will relinquish control and we will give it over to God and we will allow Him to be the one who enables us to move forward and to know that He is watching over us and He will continue to sustain us until the day He chooses to call us home. That's our confidence. Can I encourage you, if you're feeling a little bit anxious, if you're a little bit worried, cry out and receive strength from God to help you in your time of need. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you graciously enable us, you graciously strengthen us, you graciously help us in these difficult times. I pray for those who are struggling. I pray for those who are worried about losing job, losing income worried about perhaps family members, whatever their anxieties, whatever their concerns may be. I want to pray, Lord, that in the midst of those concerns, they would run to you. They would find protection in you, care in you, and strength from you to sustain them. And I pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen.